Hey, welcome to the broadcast. My name is Jeremy Fine. I'm the pastor here at Accelerate Church, and this is my wife. Hi, I'm Erin, and we are so excited here at Accelerate Church that you have joined and tuned in today. And we invite you to come sometime. Just come visit us. We'd love to have you and see you. And I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit has a word just for you today. You may be going through all kinds of things in life, but if you will tune in to His voice and His word, He has your answer. That's right. If you can't join us in person at 10 a.m. on Sundays at 4400 South Crockett, then you ought to go to our website, AccelerateChurch.cc. We have all our sermons there, and you can watch our services live and be a part of what God is doing here at Accelerate Church. But right now, we're going to get into the word today. One thing that keeps Christians from being fully convinced that God is able to do what He promised is they don't know what He promised. And just because I as a preacher tell you what He promised, if you don't know it for yourself, chapter and verse, then you can't just take my word for it. You can't just take the word of man. It's got to be the word of God. Somebody said, well, now, Scripture was written by man. No, it was written by God. God used men Over 40 different authors there, he was moving upon them. They were basically secretaries for him. So, you know, Farrell does secretarying for me. And if I ask her, hey, I need you to write a letter. This has happened before. She She writes the letter. But the letter's for me. That's exactly what the Bible is. It's from God. He used men to pen it. And so don't ever get all bogged down in the argument. Well, it was written by man. It ain't perfect. You know how many times I've heard that nonsense? This Bible has already been proved over and over and over again. There's already been too many pagans come with the hatred of God's Word and try to disprove it, and they're dead and burning in hell, and God's Word marches on. You might as well side with this because this is true. You may not believe it's true, but it's true. you got to get to where you not only believe it, but you're convinced that what God said is true. You see, I believe it so much, I'm so stirred up about what's going on in the Middle East right now because I know what the Bible says. And I know nations are coming, and they're going to be stirred up, and we don't know everything about the timing of everything, but I tell you what, I've mentioned, I don't know how many times, the story of when I was little, and at the house, I was 8, 9, 10 years old, me and my sister cleaning on Saturday, and mom said, stop what you're doing, because she heard a radio drama where Israel was at war. Guess what happened Saturday morning? I wake up, I look at my phone, and early in the morning, my dad texts me, Israel is at war. It ain't no radio drama, it's the real McCoy. So I told my wife, Israel's at war. I started looking up and seeing what's happening. And I tell you, it's, it's ugly what's happening. And I'll let you know, Hezbollah, who also is now uh, saying they're going to come against Israel. Hezbollah, Hamas, you might say, what are they? These are terrorist organizations. And uh, Hezbollah is here in America, by the way. There's a lot of them in America. And don't you think that America's not in their crosshairs? I do not say any of this to make you fear. I say this, you better pay attention to what you're doing. You better make sure you're fully convinced that God's word is true and you're in the ark of safety. I mean, you're here tonight, so I believe you're probably pretty convinced. Because after all, Americans are so busy, they ain't got time for church no more. But here we are at church sitting here. To the world, this is crazy. Why do you want to come here and go and preach? I mean, seriously, because God's word is coming forth here. And I have to be fully convinced that what God said is true. Let me tell you this. Those terrorist organizations are fronts for Iran. And it's been prophesied that Iran is going to be a part of what's going to happen. And I believe this, that no matter if this is Ezekiel 38 war or not, here's what you need to know, not be so concerned about that as this. What's going to happen is, Israel's going to have to be stirred up for someone to come with the seven-year peace treaty to calm everything down. We are, folks, living on the edge of biblical prophecy. This is an exciting time. This is not a time to try to pry your eyes awake at church. This is a time to be wide awake, edge of your seat. What is going on? I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. You better be stirred up about it. Amen. Amen you got to be convinced of it, though. It shouldn't be that i I got to get to church because, man, I'm telling you, this world's wearing me down. I don't believe anymore. You know, there's some Christians that have lived their whole life, and they go from church service to church service. They usually don't come on Wednesday night. But, but they go from church service to church service. 
most from Sunday to Sunday. And all that whole time, they're filling their ears with unbelief. So they have to get back in church, and the pastor has to pump them up, pump them up, pump them up, pump them up to try to get them. But see, someone that's fully convinced, they don't live like that. They ain't got time to hear all that trash. There's a lot of trash out here in this world. And its purpose is to get you where you're not convinced. It's a good thing Abraham didn't get out of this. He was fully convinced, the Bible says. I didn't even got past one verse tonight. I'm almost out of time already. What was he fully convinced of? That what God had promised, he was able to perform it. Listen, God's the one that promised, I'm coming again. Have you read the last book in Revelation? Three times he says it. Behold, I come quickly. I'm fully convinced he's coming. So, well, I'm tired of hearing about this. What? Shake yourself. I don't know what you're facing, but I got to tell you, there is hope in the fact that the king is coming. Because even if you're losing someone or you lost someone that you love, let me tell you something. Those that die in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them together in the air. Forever will be with the Lord. I'm comforting you with these words tonight. I'm fully convinced of those words. It's not just you know, a memory verse I learned somewhere. I am convinced of this memory verse I learned. That it's true. What's true? That not everyone is going to die. Oh, I show you a mystery. 1 Corinthians 15. We're not all going to die. I don't, this is not my notes, but you need to catch it. This is a secret to some. But we all shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that's a secret. Here you are, walking with God in this end time hour, or at least in a place where there's several people in this room walking with God, so the truth can come forth like that unhindered. And you can hear that the King is coming. What mercy God is having on your soul to even hear this message tonight. The King is coming. Are you convinced? Well, then your lifestyle should show it. I like the amens. You know I like that talking about it. But let me tell you something. It's got to go beyond that. It's got to be a lifestyle that you are living. Even when no one's looking. Even if no one finds out, are you fully convinced that God is who he says he is? Because see, if you were, let me just tell you something, young people. You wouldn't be messing around with each other physically outside of marriage. Let me just be honest with you. Neither would you adults. Maybe, uh, hey, I, better, I better back off, huh? Maybe some of you, you could keep your legs closed if you believe Jesus was coming. Maybe so. If you were fully convinced, you'd keep them trousers up. I came to preach tonight. I don't care what religious devil don't like it. I'm talking about being fully convinced. See, see, if people aren't fully convinced, they'll shout at church and they'll go do these things I'm talking about here. I don't mean to be mean to you. I'm trying to get you to wake up. Let me tell you something. Sin's a real problem. If you're living in fornication, you're not fully convinced Jesus is coming. If you're living a lie, let me tell you something. You're not fully convinced the king is coming. The king is coming. More sure than your next breath. Quicker than any lightning bolts come out of any cloud, my king's coming. Faster than any wheel has ever turned on any axle, my king is coming. And you better believe this. Hey, Pastor Jeremy here from Accelerate Church. And his wife, Erin. And we want to invite you this Christmas season to Accelerate Church. If you're in need of peace, joy, love, hope, wisdom, these are all gifts Jesus gives. And come to church. It's found in his word. That's right. Every Sunday, 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We'd love to see you soon. And we want to wish you a a Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. Let me tell you, Abraham had opportunities to not be fully convinced. But this he was believing for a child. I'm believing for the king. I want to see the king. Praise God. Well, he, he believed it, and then look at verse 22. Finally getting to verse 2 here tonight. Therefore, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Well, bless God. Isn't that good news? It is. Say, yes, that's good news. I'll give you the answer right here, you know. Verse 23, it wasn't written, though, for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him. No, listen, it was for us, verse 24. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. 
<laughs> Abraham was fully convinced, and that's written for us. So that we'll be fully convinced. It's not just written like, oh, that's a neat story. Abraham was convinced he got a son. He did. That is neat, but that's not where it ends. That was written for you and me. Now be ready. When you get fully convinced, the unconvinced are going to get ticked off. You really want to know those who are not fully convinced in your life, go ahead and live a fully convinced lifestyle and they will show up. They will manifest almost on the spot. And you know what they're going to say? It hey, don't take all that. Ah, oh, you got you a bunch of religion, a bunch of do's and don'ts. God doesn't care about that. No, the Bible's full of do's and don'ts. The New Testament alone has over 120 commands to you. I mean, what kind of devil in hell? God doesn't care about that. That's some dingling that doesn't know God. Why would you listen to them for one more second? You know what those, I've heard that people say, oh, people, you, you need to lighten up. God don't care about the do's and don'ts. He just wants me to crawl up in his lap and talk to him. Well, I tell you what, I love it when my children crawl up in my lap and talk to me. I do. But I tell you, they can crawl up in my lap, but if they don't do what I told them, they get disciplined. I expect them to obey. You can crawl up in my lap or not. I like it. That's great. But you know what I really like? When I say, hey, come here. Boom, they come. Hey, do this. Boom, they do it. I say, man, look at you. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. That's obedience. Why? What am I saying? And why would I say it's awesome? The natural mind's like, does someone obey? No, because here's what I found out. That when you obey, God is at work. And I'm training my children that. Every parent is anointed to train their child to get God working in their life. How? Give them a command. Tell them to make their bed. Somebody said, well, that ain't spiritual. Yeah, it is. You missed it. It's an opportunity to obey. Somebody says, what are you talking about? Philippians chapter 2. You could read it sometime. Verse 12. Paul tells the whole church, you obeyed not only my presence, but much more in my absence. Therefore, it's God that is at work in you. Whew. When you obey, God is at work. When you disobey, Satan's at work. Wow. I like this tonight. I'm just in this flow. I, I'm not really even flow, following my notes very good here. But I tell you what, there's enough life coming forth to change everything about the trajectory of your life. Are you convinced? We ended Sunday looking at Hebrews 6. They talks about some details of the covenant. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. As a kid growing up in church, when I would hear someone go to Hebrews and start talking about the details of the covenant, I would get lost in all the talk. And I'd kind of lose the gist of what's even being said. What's being said? Well, we're not going to reread Hebrews 6. If you want to hear it, go back and listen to Sunday because we read several verses there. But here's the point that we came to and the conclusion we got to at the end of service that God... He decided to make a blood covenant to fully convince people that he is who he says he is. He got down to our level and said, you know what? The only way I can get this is basically a contract. Let me just say this. If, you know, car salesmen could tell you this, uh, realtors could tell you this, and other people in sales could tell you this, you don't have a deal until they sign the dotted line. Right? You ain't got a deal. You got some tire kickers till they sign the, the line. And then give some money. And God, he knows that about you and I. Now, I modernized it, talking about those things, because you know buying a house is that way, buying, buying a car. I remember Aaron and I, we bought our first house. We were so thrilled. We went, and the paperwork pile was like this big. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. What all am I signing away here, Todd? I was like, man, nobody reads all this. What I wanted to get down to is what's this going to cost me per month? <laughs> That's what I was, I was like, just tell me, what is this going to cost? Okay, I'll commit to pay that. What's the interest rate? Right? And so, I mean, that's what I was looking at, those type of things. I didn't read all the mumbo jumbo of everything. I didn't. And neither have you many times when you signed. Right? The sad thing is, many times people have been in services where God's on the move, and they feel that draw of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't really read the details in the Word of what's required for Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Here's what it means. You're no longer in control of your life. 
<laughs> it means you don't get to do whatever you want because he bought your body. That means you can't pierce it and, do, and tat it and do all that you want because that's what I do. I'm going to be a witness. Shut up, you rebel. Read your Bible. God said, I'm going to deal, deal severely with those that mark their body. That's what he said. Christian, I don't believe that. It's amazing to me how you can sit in a church like this even, and you can believe one day, but you let enough wrong voices in, and all of a sudden you stop believing. And if you had the opportunity to come and ask me one-on-one, I could show you, well, let's read the Bible right here. Let's read it slowly. Let's read it. Let's see what it says. Now, am I preaching my opinion or the Bible? See, this is what you have to know for yourself. But if you don't study your Bible, then you're not going to know. But I'm called by God to preach the word to you so that you can build your life on the rock so that when the winds blow and the storm comes, you're not shaken and destroyed, but you keep standing, praise God. I'm talking about you right in front of your face. You build your life on the word, you're able to withstand anything that comes your way. But I tell you right now, some people, the slightest little offense comes, the slightest little wind blows. And guess what? The devil knows he's going to huff and puff and blow your house down. Because it's straw. It's not really based in the word. Well, God said, I know people are going to have a hard time believing this, so I'm going to go to great lengths, give my own son to make a blood covenant. And once you understand blood covenant, and I've taught series on it. You need to go listen to them. I'm not going to preach that tonight. But once you understand the seriousness of a blood covenant that was paid for you individually, then you have the ability to be sure and steadfast in a rocking world. Hey, Pastor Jeremy here from Accelerate Church. And his wife, Erin. And we want to invite you this Christmas season to Accelerate Church. If you're in need of peace, joy, love, hope, wisdom, these are all gifts Jesus gives. And come to church. It's found in his word. That's right. Every Sunday, 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. We'd love to see you soon. And we want to wish you a, a Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. What set David apart from all of his colleagues was he was fully convinced. Based on what? The covenant. I want to show you this in 1 Samuel 17. Let's go here tonight. And this will be as far as we get here in 1 Samuel. We'll stop after 1 Samuel tonight. 1 Samuel 17. Are you alive tonight? Still glad to be in this New Testament church? Yes. Praise God. 1 Samuel 17, 22, David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. See, his dad commissioned him to go take some supplies to his brothers in the war. He ran to the army. I love the way the Bible has these details in it. 1 Samuel 17, 22 is where I'm reading. He came and he greeted his brothers. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, I will add in here, scholars say the reason he was the champ, he was undefeated. I bet so. Some scholars say he was nine foot. Some say he's 12 foot. He's somewhere between nine and 12 foot tall. And this boy was a bad, bad boy. Never lost a fight. Here he was, coming from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Verse 24, 1 Samuel 17, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. Why? Because of his words. Maybe that's you when the doctor gave his word. It doesn't say David was dreadfully afraid and fled, no. It says the men of Israel. Why? Day after day, they'd been listening to his words. There's no recording that day after day they were listening to the words of God. But there's a recorded that day after day they're listening to the words of Goliath. Whose words are you listening to? Verse 25, 1 Samuel 17. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? What are they looking at? The giant. You never take a giant's head off looking at the giant and talking about how big he is. Look what they said, the men of Israel. Notice who's saying this. This is not David. This is the men of Israel, the ones, you know, afraid, hiding, knees knocking. That's who's saying this. They said, surely he's come up to defy Israel. They're looking at the enemy the wrong way. 
They're taking it personal, forgetting their covenant. When you're in covenant with God and the enemy attacks you, he attacks God. If you're a covenant breaker, that doesn't apply to you. And surely he's come up. By the way, sin is breaking covenant because sin is always self-will. Surely he's come up to defy Israel. Who has he come up to defy according to the men that are afraid? Israel. Everybody say Israel. It shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. What a deal. Will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. It sounds like to me this has been going on a while and the king's making this a deal that he's hoping somebody will have the courage to confront. Because he himself didn't have the courage to confront. Verse 26, David spoke. Pay close attention. He spoke to the men who stood by him. And here's what he said. Uh, what shall be done for the man that kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now, I want you to check this out. Look right here. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Oh, I've preached this before, but catch this. This shows you words always reveal whether someone's convinced or not. What is he convinced of? Not how big he is, not that he's the champion, not the words he spoke, but the fact that he is out of covenant with God. That's what was, he was looking at. Who is this guy not in covenant? His confidence, his complete conviction was in the covenant he had with his God. It wasn't in him flexing. Because I'm sorry, a 17 ruddy boy flexing with freckles doesn't make the giant afraid. Doesn't make him quake at all to just look at the natural. But David wasn't looking at the natural. Now get this, if you're going to be fully convinced, you can't keep looking at the natural. If all you do is look at the way it looks, the way it feels, guess what? Goliath's going to eat your lunch every day, pop the bag right in your ear. Day after day. That's how the enemy's going to do. He's going to laugh at you. David stands up and says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies?" Not of Israel, but of the living God. Doubling down on the fact he's looking at this through covenant eyes. How do you look at things? Well, I'm dealing with my sickness. Uh Uh-oh, you're looking at it wrong. It ain't yours. Redemption's already been paid for healing. Healing is yours. So every time sickness tries to attack, you got to know, wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute, this is illegal. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine trying to show his ugly head in my life? I tell you what, I'm going to take your head off. You say, you know what, you're not just defying me, you're defying the living God. David was fully convinced because of the covenant he was in with God. Because see, when he was watching his dad's sheep, he wasn't just watching sheep. Yes, he was obeying what his dad said, but he's out there singing to the Lord, praises. Yeah, he was out there playing his instrument to the Lord. He was out there lifting up his voice to the Lord, praying to the Lord, Jehovah, who lives, the living God. And he knew his covenant with God. This is, in my opinion, and I think you'd have to agree, the biggest difference in his approach and all the other trained soldiers that, by the way, are quaking under the rocks, hiding. This is the biggest difference in his approach. What? I'm fully convinced that God that I'm in covenant with is bigger than this hairy giant. Well, the people answered in this manner, verse 27. I'm in 1 Samuel 17. They said, so it will be done for the man that kills him. But now Eliab, his older brother, heard when he spoke to the men. Now, Eliab is in the sin of familiarity, not to mention fear, because he's afraid. That's like the double whammy. You get in fear, and then you allow the sin of familiarity to eat your lunch and pop the bag in your ear like I just said a while ago. Guess what? You ain't getting the victory. You're going to have to break free from this mess. Eliab, his anger was aroused against who? Hold up. Not against the giant. There's the giant popping off. He's afraid. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And that made his older brother mad at him. You talk about someone that's a ding and can't get their anger in the right spot. 
Why are you mad at David? Because he's fully convinced and you're not. You see it? He's fully convinced and Eliab's not. Eliab's hiding. David's like, oh, no, I'm in covenant with God. Eliab's like, who? What are you doing, David? Why did you even come down here? With whom have you left, left those few? Why does it got to be few? Those few sheep in the wilderness. In other words, what you're doing ain't nothing. You know how many people I've had tell me that? Oh, you're starting a Christian school? Oh, <laughs> they ain't. In other words, that's, that's Eliab's in my life. Like, oh, brother. Oh, brother, we're changing lives, making warriors. That's all right, though. I mean, you, I don't have to have Eliab on my team yet. I got some Davids with me, praise God. <laughs> but look what he said. Why did you come down here? You can just hear it in his voice. Of course, he's angry, so it may not sound like that little weak whine. It's probably more mad. Who'd you leave those few sheep with there? Look what he says to David. I know your pride. Now, I want you to catch this. I said this Sunday. When you're fully convinced, there will be people that mistake that for arrogance. And you see it in this story. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. In other words, you just want to be a spectator to us warriors. Well, well hold up. You're hiding, bro. You're the one quaking back there. The first Quaker back there. So we're quaking for the wrong thing, though. Verse 29. <laughs> I like this. This alone is, there's a whole message in this, but I just can't preach it tonight. I'm, I, you got to catch this, though. David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Yeah, there's a cause, all right. It's called covenant. It's called I'm fully convinced. I'm sorry, you're not, older brother. I don't know what's your problem. What voice you've been listening to? Is there not a cause? He looked at Goliath differently than Eliab. Because he was fully convinced. What was he convinced of? That God is who he says he is. That God was well able to do what he said he could do, deliver him from any enemy. And that he was able to defeat the giant. We know that because go down to verse 33. i got to move quick now. Now they bring David in front of Saul. After he decided not to take the bait of offense from his older brother. See, by the way. A lot of you started out great like David, but when offense and that opportunity comes, will you pass the test or will you eat the bait? Pastor Jeremy here. That's all the time we have today, so I hate to interrupt myself preaching there, but we had a good time today. Yes, we did, and we invite <laughs> you to come in person. Come see us. Stop by and say, hey, Pastor Jeremy, hey, Miss Aaron, I saw you on TV because we would love to meet you Absolutely. and shake your hand. Absolutely, and be sure and tune in again next time on the same station, same time for the Accelerate Church television broadcast.